So let's talk a minute about mobile HF antennas. There's really when you break it down, there's multiband and then there's single band antennas. Single band antenna, if they're only interested in working one band, then that's probably your best bet. Unless it's one of the lower bands, I know some of those may not work as well. There's homebrew antennas, uh, the Webster band spanners, a, a multi band antenna, which is real popular back in the 80s and 90s. For the multi band antennas, probably your most common you're going to find is the screwdriver type. It's a couple of different manufacturers. I think High Sierra makes one, MFJ might even make one. Past number of years, the most popular, in my opinion, has been the Tar Heel. I tell you, I know a lot of guys got them. That's what I use. It's a real good antenna, solidly built, stand behind the product. It's just a well built, good antenna. Now, they're not exactly inexpensive. However, when you compare it, uh, Scorpion makes a real high performance uh, screwdriver antenna. I know one guy that's got one of, well, a couple of guys, and uh, one real close friend that has one. And it's an incredibly expensive antenna. You know, look to spend close to $1,000 for that, just for that one antenna, which, you know, is the price of these big tri-banders you're gonna put up at home, so. It all depends on what your price price range in, is, um, you know, what you find on the used market. There's nothing wrong with, with looking in the used market for that type of stuff. Because you will find them. And that's a good way to save a lot of money. You just need to look at it make sure it's in good shape. Benefits about the multi-band, like the screwdriver, is you can change bands while in the vehicle going down the road. And I like that versatility. And it makes it real easy if you're tuning around, if you don't hear anything, you can change bands. You don't have to pull over, change an antenna, or in like the uh, buck catcher antennas, move a tap on the coil. It's not going to slow you down. And maybe that's not a big deal to you. That's fine. Uh, but, you know, it's just something I think is well spent money for that type of thing. On those type of antennas where you have to move taps, they're, they're still expensive in itself. I know there's some newer stuff out there with some different electronics. I'm not familiar with those. I don't really know anybody that has one. And I haven't used one. I've just seen uh, the stuff in like uh, QST and some you know online stuff. But I don't really know a lot about those. So you know if you do or if you have used those or know somebody that has, leave a comment down below and let us know what you think about it. But you know, it's all going to kind of depend on your installation. How big of a mount you want to use, because the multi-band, you know, antennas like the screwdriver, the buck catcher, it's, it's a lot of load. You need a tough, heavy-duty mount and a good place to mount it. Uh, if you don't want something as big, they got the smaller versions for, like, only goes down to 40 meters. It won't get you 80. I know some people actually get 160 mobile, but... I don't know if you want to attempt that have fun with that but getting back to where you're going to mount it what type of vehicle you have and all that's up completely up to you and the purpose of this video is just to kind of give you an idea to get you thinking it's not a one-stop end all this is how you got to do it every installation is going to be a little bit different and there's nothing wrong with that and they and they should be um, if you get down into it, you'll probably find a way that works better for you than did somebody else. Think about that before you go out and buy an antenna, or it's if you know if you find a deal on one, well maybe that's how you start out. Like I said, everyone's a little different, but the key things: where can I mount it? What's going to work best for me? What? How do I want to operate? Do I want to be able to change bands while going down the road? Is it okay if I have to pull over and change bands? Maybe it's not that big a deal, but that's totally up to you. But I just wanted to put that out there. Now, some of the things you need to consider if you're going to do HF Mobile is, first of all, the radio. What radio are you going to pick? Now, you may want to go through and look through your vehicle and see where a good place to mount, how big the display is, is it... Are you able to separate the display from the actual body and mount that somewhere else and see how much room you have 
available. Cars today, vehicles today are littered with knobs and buttons and touch screen displays and for navigation, infotainment, and all of that. So you're gonna need to look at that. And maybe you want to use uh, a type of gooseneck or something that mounts to a bolt on the seat that comes up, kind of like I did. We're gonna get into a little bit of that. But you need to, first of all, how are you gonna mount stuff in your vehicle? Then you need to find where to mount it. Trucks seem to have a little better flat surfaces and other hiding places than some other vehicles. Uh, I, I've seen many screwdrivers or the juniors on BMWs, Mercedes. Uh, nobody has actually been bold enough to drill a hole through a body panel for that, which is probably a good thing. I personally like things to look kind of EOM, original equipment, and that's probably not going to look that way, but that's all right. We can do the best we can. I don't like drilling holes uh, where it's easily to be seen and don't, you know, messing up the carpet. My uh, thought process is I'm eventually going to trade in or sell this vehicle. I don't want to have to explain, well, what's all this? So, you know, if you got to make some cuts and some carpets and whatnot, you're going to try to do that where it's not going to be seen. So in your passenger compartment of your vehicle, look around. You want to see what you can mount where, where is it going to be convenient to use, where is it going to be safe for you to use, um, thing, keeping things out of the way and not getting, you know, if you got a gear shift here in the center, you don't want your mic cable getting coiled up and caught up in that, uh, especially if you have a manual uh, transmission or, you know, a handbrake or things of that nature. Uh, trucks, like my vehicle, this is a 2016 Silverado. You got this great big uh, center console here that will lift up. But I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there because part of it is the Apple CarPlay for my vehicle. It has to plug into the uh, USB port inside the center console. And look, I found something I was looking for. Look at that. So that's probably going to need to be down for most people to be able to use that. Um, sure, there's other accessory ports uh, around the vehicle, but that's the one that's going to give you functionality for features of the vehicle you paid a lot of money for. So, you know, that needs probably needs to be down most of the time. As you can hear, it gets used and there's stuff in it. Now, what I like about the Chevy vehicle, there's another compartment down here that can be locked. And this is where I mounted the body for my 7100. You may notice that HF radios today, especially ones marketed as mobile, or even actually some mobile radios, uh, VHF, UHF, do not come with mounting brackets. Uh, that's been a new thing, and they'll charge you $30 for a factory mountain bracket, which I think is quite rude, but what are you going to do? So for me, I had my VHF UHF rig that came with a bracket mounted in here. Now, when I got the 7100, that came out, and I didn't have a bracket for the 7100. However, it's snug enough and it fits in here quite nicely to where I don't really need it. It doesn't really bounce around. So that works for me. And, you know, you can wrap the cables around. There's plenty of room inside. Even uh, you get a, some, there's some notches around and all that. There gets some airflow. I've been on VHF or UHF for quite a long time. At a point, transmitting a long time. Very long conversation. And you can watch the heat on the 7100, uh, the temperature, the internal temperature of it, it'll give you an indication. And it never really got hot. It might've got a little warm, but it never got hot. And you just pop the top just a little bit and that will let some, some air escape. But it's been rock solid, very happy with it. No complaints with that. Let me show you. Here we have, I have the radio mounted here and it's on this little gooseneck that mounts to the a bolt under the seat. That I think you can probably see there, don't mind the wrappers. Uh, 
and that works very well for me. And it's pretty, it's very solid. I thought when I first took it out, I'm like, my God, this thing is stiff. But you kind of, you kind of want it stiff. That way it doesn't move around so easily. And here's this compartment I was telling you about, which will actually lock. There's a um, key here so you can actually lock it. And I ended up, I drilled one hole in there that I realized I didn't have to do. I could have come up through the back. And you see there's a big enough gap right there where the uh, some of the coax is coming through to get in and route that. So if I'd have done it over, I'd have noticed that first. There is a speaker in the back of this. However, most speakers, internal speakers, are rubbish. So this is the external speaker I had for my uh, VHF, UHF only rig. And I just screwed that into the uh, carpet there. It's out of the way. And, you know, these little notches for the cables run out. This goes to the head. That goes to the power for the GPS and the GPS antenna. You lock it down here. And it's very comfortable to use. So that works for me just fine. And uh, I didn't buy an additional mount for this up under here. So it doesn't, it's not the most secure. I've had it come off a couple of times. That's the only, that's one thing I need to go back and actually get. I just reused the one that for the head for my Kenwood that I had in here. I had to offset some holes a little bit, kind of catty corner, but it works fine. I've had it in here for over a year now. So that's a couple of things to look for inside the cab. Now, one, another thing you want to do, you want to route cables out of the way. We'll go under the vehicle. And I'll show you what I did for power and getting the control and uh, transmission, the coax to the antenna on the back, also with the custom mount that I had fabricated. Side note, you want to run power directly to the battery. Um, most of the accessory, 12 volt accessory outlets anymore, uh, can, you can pull about 10, 12 amps out of those and then the breaker of the fuse is gonna pop. And they're all fed off of one, so if you pop one, you aren't going to pop all of them, which can be a real pain. Run it straight to the battery. I don't like drilling through firewalls. I think that's a bad idea. I was actually able to find a uh, plug. I was I'm sure it's for some other accessory uh, for the vehicle uh, that was actually plastic that I could drill through, and then you just seal that up right up under the carpet. You, look, you found it from crawling up under the vehicle. First thing you need to do is do some exploring around your vehicle. Where are you going to mount the radio? Where are you going to mount the display if you can separate them? How are you going to route cables? Um, look under the hood. Look under the vehicle. Look on the back. Where are you going to mount your antenna? Uh, those are all things you need you need to think about. You don't want to be halfway through something and then say, oh God, this isn't going to work because you're probably going to have your vehicle tore halfway apart and then you need to run and go get parts. That's not going to work all that well. Do some exploring first. Now, like I said, uh, you want to go straight to the batteries. Here we are under the hood of my 2016 Silverado and I was able to find a plug underneath the passenger compartment uh, pretty much under the passenger seat. He was able to slide the seat all the way back. Under the carpet there was a plug. You take off the side molding and you can get to the carpet. I found it from looking up under the vehicle. Remember, I said you need to do some exploring. Poke around before you make all your decisions. Get a plan together and get most of everything or everything you're going to need that you could think of. Odds are you're not going to think of absolutely everything. So you may want to have a buddy come over give you a hand and at least you have another vehicle if you don't have two vehicles to run and get some parts if you need to now I'll show you so here we are underneath so here's where it comes up it actually comes rides right up through the um, shroud on the fender well here comes up here zip tied it close probably need to zip cut these off we were in a hurry and goes right to the ground there. Now, they do generally recommend you take it to a chassis inside the vehicle. I didn't. 
But the good, only thing I had to do, I had to cut this part off with the fuses. So you see, there's the fuse boxes, the factory fuses. And you want to fuse as close to the battery as you can. That way if something shorts down the line, it's post fuse and you will short the fuse out, breaking the energy flow and it won't melt your vehicle. So, and the nice thing about this vehicle, there's a little clip that goes over the positive end, keeps all the hash trash out, fork terminal, um, loosen that nut up, slide it in there and tighten it back down. She's good to go. So that makes that real easy. Uh, the other thing is coming up underneath. Like I said, I don't like cutting drilling holes in firewalls. It's just too much problems. So we'll get under the vehicle. We'll take a look at how we ran uh, the power cable. So we are at the back of the vehicle. I went with the Tar Heel screwdriver antenna. Actually, a friend of mine, I guess this is kind of a permanent or long-term loan because uh, I've been talking about it. He said he had one laying around. He wasn't planning on using it. I said, here, take this. I already had had him out from a previous vehicle I had, so I was able to use parts of that and get everything going. Uh, so I came in from the side of the hitch, and not where the receiver is. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, I had to do some fabricating and had a local fab shop measure it out. Took the measurements, gave it to them, showed them what I wanted. I haven't lost any capabilities in the vehicle, so I can still tow. I still have the hitch. It's wide open, and it's off on the driver's side. Now, the reason you stick with the driver's side is because when you're going down a country road and you're on the right side of the road, not only is it the correct side, all your trees are on the right side of the vehicle when you're going down because that's the side closest to closest to the woods, however you want to call it. That's where all your trees and that type of stuff is going to be. And if you put it on the right side of the vehicle, where you would think would be opposite, actual opposite of the driving position, um, it really does, you'll, you'll beat it up. I know some people, I got one friend, he put it on that side, then a week later they came back and they moved it to the other because he went down the road and trees, low hanging trees, and just beat it all up. And these antennas are not cheap. You know, a Tar Heel antenna can set you back five, six hundred bucks. So it's not really something you want to be tearing up and, and beating to death when you don't have to. So that's why you go on the driver's side. So this is the piece we had fabricated, this little bracket here, which you go straight, makes a 90, comes up, makes another 90, and then goes into the side of the hitch. Well, now this particular hitch is square tubing. Some are round tubing. Um, square tubing can be a little bit easier to get this in place. If you slide it in there, you don't have to worry about it rolling and getting everything straight. If you go in there and, and sit, and you can drill the holes and everything's okay. It makes it a little bit easier. It's not saying you can't do it with the round. It's just uh, the round tubing is going to be a little more difficult uh, to deal with. There's some things you could do. You could um, drill a hole, put a uh, jam screw in there just to hold it still while you get the other holes drilled and cinch it up. Uh, but anyway, this, this vehicle came, the hitch is square, so I was able to find actual square tubing to fit, slide directly in. It's a little bit of play, but that's why you drill. There's two holes. We drilled two holes on the bottom, uh, tap the inside of uh, this, it slides inside of it. So this is tapped and then we don't tap the holes that are drilled through the hitch mounts because you want to cinch this down to the hitch. If they're both tapped, they're not going to do that and they'll play and they'll just cause problems in the long run. So you want to make that hole a little bit bigger. Um, it, it, it takes some time, you know, sliding in and out. Because uh, you got to get the holes right, but it's just it's not something you want to rush. Take your time, do this right. Because, like I said, these antennas are not cheap. You don't want to really skimp too much on the installation. So, we'll go underneath and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Here we are up underneath. You see, there it is, and there's the two holes. Now, 
I screwed up on, <laughs> on that one. And so that's why that bolt's a little bit bigger. And having two different sizes is not bad. They're stainless, splat washers, and lock washers. So, you know, this, this silver part, that's tapped. And those are just, in the black square tubing, that's just a drilled out hole, not tapped. So you go through that, cinch that down, and this thing, it isn't going anywhere. So that's really the proper way to do that. And it also gives you a little arm to run your cables out. So it comes out, it's open. The only thing I wish we'd have done is drilled a hole in this post up under here so it would, it would drain. It's uh, full of water after all the rain we've had, but we will address that. Uh, this post, I had this from a, an older mount from one I've had previous. We cut that off, they were able to weld that. And then I painted the whole thing two coats of the Rust-Oleum galvanized paint. And I think that was a good idea or the whole thing would be completely rusty uh, by now. So there's the mount. Two bolts. The rest of the stuff's all it can be, uh, you know, the Tar Heel brand, whatever it is. So there's that plug I was telling you about. It's plastic. It's held in there. It's glued in. But I was able to drill right through it. That was real easy. And then we just run the cables, as you can see, along down the chassis line. Opens in the chassis. Something where some other wires are going on down. And you can secure them to that. Now, you can run up under the ridges of the bed if you have a truck. You can usually get up under there. What I like to use, get you if you got a fish tape, you can use that or just a metal clothes hanger. Straighten that out or a good uh, stiff piece of wire. Slide it up in there, you can tape to it and pull it straight through and it makes it real easy. And then once you got it at the back of the truck, you can make all your connections up. And it's, it's not that bad at all. All right, so one thing we definitely need to talk about is grounding. You want to use a good braid. Uh, you can come down to terminals if you'd like. Um, I kind of like if you just got a screw with a big enough head, you can use that. Now this this coating on here is it's not it's a soft coating. It's kind of odd. So really, what you got to do find your hole where you want to put it. And if you can find some other holes, you know, that you can use, that's great. Um, and you don't have to drill into it. However, like some of these other holes up in here, you may be able to see or not. Use like there, use for other accessories and whatnot. Um, You can use some of those holes for other accessories that, uh, if you don't plan on purchasing anything to mount to those holes. Uh, but the coating is is soft, so if you try to take a wire brush to it, you're just going to gum a uh, wire brush. And you really need to get down to the metal. So here's what I found. You take a flat, big flat screwdriver, you scrape it as much as you can, dab a little bit of gasoline or a rag, and wipe it on there and it takes that right off <clears throat> and it doesn't take you know just where you've kind of scraped is where it's going to take it off and that's where you secure it to so you want to go to the chassis from the other body panels and you know there's uh mounting brackets and all that for all the other body panels that it secures to the chassis but you want to make sure you actually go to the chassis with your grounds and you kind of want to do that um, uh, if you got a pickup truck, all four corners of the bed, or at least two of the corners of the bed, uh, the engine or the passenger compartment and the engine compartment. So there's a lot of stuff out there online that even say the doors and the hood and running straps and all that. I have not gotten that far along in it. Um, I started this in a February, uh, getting ready to go to Orlando last year and then it got hot 
after it got finished being cold this year it's been raining like crazy i haven't had spent a lot of time doing that however i did run a few key grounds i got the bed to the chassis and the passenger apartment to the to the chassis in a, a couple of places um really the only thing i need left is like the quarter panels up front and I'll be I'll be pretty happy and you definitely need to do this if you plan on running an amplifier but this will help noise it will help um, getting the antenna to tune 